another session of uh, the third day of the Goa Arts and Literary Festival, third edition. Today, the um, audience is small but significant for a particularly exciting panel. Um, I'm sorry we've been running late. One of the events we've had to shift here is, has been Lande Goa's uh, talk on his amazing translation of Kamohis, but that will be tomorrow, so we'll have that opportunity to talk to him. Uh, Musharraf is going to be participating in a children's book festival, which is going to be starting very shortly in a uh, beautiful square in Panjab. So he has to go down there also. Um, but I kind of uh, put the panel together, so I'd like to maybe introduce it along with Chandrahas. Chandrahas is, uh, is uh, currently the poetry editor of Caravan Magazine, is that right? Um, but he's also one of India's brightest multi-talented um, writers. He is a critic of significance. I first started encountered him from his very, very lucid, acerbic criticism. Then I learned how young he is. It was a bit, uh, you know, galling. But that's the case. He's also a novelist, uh, you know, a uh, acclaimed novelist, and he and a poet, a terrific poet. Um, and recently he, uh, he helped to bring our own Joseph Furtado from Goa, who uh, was the first really significant Indo-Anglian poet in a way, um, who was published in England um, at the turn of the century. He helped him come back to kind of prominence with, uh, might I say, curious choice of uh, poems from Furtado's curve for Caravan magazine. So Ch Chandrahas is going to be <coughs> um, kind of moderating or helping to steer this conversation between these two luminaries. Part of it is because because he's uh, such a significant, extraordinary talent. Who's, he's just been a, 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 won a fellowship, is it called, to go to Iowa? Uh, isn't it a fellowship? Is it a fellowship? Residency. It's a residency at the, at the Iowa Writers Workshop, which, uh, which, you know, very, very few and the best Indian writers have gone to. So Chandrahas, please, would you mind joining us on stage? Thank you. Big hand, please, for that. Okay, today, the two gentlemen, I'd like to invite them up on stage before I talk about them for a minute, is Teju Kohl and Musharraf Faruqi. Both of them um, are tremendously significant in their own ways. They are both also tremendously significant in similar ways. One way in which they are both tremendously significant, which you would not have guessed, because Mr. Teju Kohl lives in America, and he's Nigerian-American, and Musharraf Faruqi lives in Pakistan, is that they are both son-in-laws of Goa. That's right. He is married to De Silva, and he is married. Karen is an Andrat, right? So this, they're both sons-in-law of Goa. So that's an interesting thing. But basically, the point of this, is the, the interesting thing about both Musharraf and Teju to me is that they have come from highly unexpected places to achieve truly, according to me, global significance, and uh, according to the world, global significance. Some years ago, Musharraf uh, Ali Faruqi, he was telling me was working in fast food restaurants in America. He was an engineering college dropout. He was packing boxes with styrofoam. Um, but he, you know, uh, decided he wanted to try his hand. He always knew that he wanted to be a writer. Today, he is a, you know, extremely award-winning translator. He's written children's books, which is why he's going down to the children's book festival. He's just written a graphic novel along with his wife, Michelle Faruqi. He's, uh, his first novel has won, you know, Every significant, many significant awards in India. Um, it's an extraordinary career. Um, he started a publishing company. He's, he's, he's he just translated the first volume of a 25-volume set of, uh, Urdu, uh, of an Urdu classic. It's an extraordinary writing career of extraordinary significance, which came out of nowhere. And the same, I think, can be said, if you don't mind me saying so, about Mr. Teju Kohl, because the world knows him now as a global superstar. But Four or five years ago, when I first encountered Mr. Teju Kohl, he was creating the best tweets. Well, maybe four years ago, was it? Or five years ago, something like that. And he didn't even have the name for the Kohl. He had a different name, but he was making amazing tweets. And he had a kind of an interest in India, I think. Or maybe he referenced India once or twice. It made me think this person might have a connection. But he was coming from a different intellectual space. Amazing tweeter. So writing amazing tweets in 140 characters and then taking amazing photographs. So he knew this was a person. Then we met, and I realized he had a Goa connection. And then 
last year, actually, almost a year and a half ago, I had to make my first trip back to the US in many years. Cage's book had just come out. I knew this man, I bought the book, and a few days later, he had the best review possibly of any fiction, of any novel in the last 10, 15 years in the New, York, New Yorker history for that book. And he came to Goa Lit Fest, he was already kind of, I already I was boasting to William Dalrymple when I met him. We, we invited him first, but Dalrymple was like, he's coming to Jaipur too. But since Jaipur, he's had the most extraordinary year, he's traveled all over the world, he's been fated all over the world, he's had surreal experiences. Both these gentlemen have kind of, you know, dared to dream. Please take it from here. Thank you. Well, welcome to you both. Um, it's been a pleasure. I have, as writers, we have some private privileges at Writers Festivals, which is to uh, sometimes have very long conversations, which uh, um, other people don't have access to. So uh, uh, it's been wonderful to get to know you both. Uh, uh, I've known Musharraf on email for four years or so without us ever meeting, and it's great. It's on the one hand, it's uh, terrible that as Indian writers and Pakistani writers are so hard to meet, um, but. Uh, it does mean that we have a suspended relationship where you only put a face to a name after years and years and years, and so it's been wonderful. Uh, I'm going to begin with you, Teju. When you go to tejupol.com uh, and look at your bio, uh, you know you're also a photographer, and there's a picture right up there of you not looking into the camera, but there's a picture of you in the uh, scene inside the side mirror of a motorbike, right in the corner of the photograph. And it seemed to me like as a that is a writer and someone who spends many years working in a book in solitude as somebody quite unknown and often in very difficult conditions. The same with you. Uh, that's what a writer's dream is like. Something that's kind of off-center and very small, and that's you want to bring it closer and closer into the center of the picture. Uh, so, what has it been like for you? That's one side of it. And the other side of the question is, what is? Uh, I'm sure many people now tell you, tell you, I'm sure you're living a dream. And is that true? And what's what's that been like? Well, first of all, thank you very much for that introduction, um, and thank you both for being on this panel with me. It's wonderful to be go again. Um, I think you start maybe with the most important question of all, which is what is the relationship between um, what is off center and what is it in the center? What is the relationship between uh, the center, the mainstream? and the periphery, because I think that's what engages all the work that I do, um, whether it's uh, photography or whether it's uh, writing essays or writing fiction. Uh, because now, the way we live now, is that with the kind of proliferation of stories and um, proliferation of realities that we're confronted with, um, everything that is not in the center is, is clamoring for its own piece of attention. And this is very important to me. I think this is actually um, the heart of my, my work at its best. What I would really like to do is to tell stories that are relegated to the periphery. And maybe keep them at the periphery, but make them loud enough to trouble what's going on in the center. So. Um, it was only this year that I realized how profoundly connected my photography and my writing are, um, because they are both very concerned with what's oblique. Why, why do you think it took you so long to figure that out? Because clearly it, seems, it seems obvious now, doesn't it? Um, well, because when I was developing both, I've been a photographer and a writer, both of them I've only been doing very seriously for about eight years. And I was so concerned with getting my craft right in each, that in a strange kind of way I didn't realize that they were both being made by the same person. And I was fortunate enough last week to take a mas uh, master class in photography with Joel Mayerowitz, and I'm a great American photographer. Um, and one of the things he said was that this is not even about photography at all, the work we do. It's about being present. It's about living as intensely as possible, and photography is just the way that we translate that into into into, uh, into something that lasts. But it's about it's about the presence. It's about the intensity of living. Um, and for me, I think I 
actually believe that it's not about writing, it's not about photography, or about drawing, or about filmmaking, or any of those things. Those things are kind of the, they're the fossils of life experience. They're the kind of sediment. They're the ash of the days that we burn. You know? And they can be beautiful in themselves, but much more interesting for me is the quality of attention behind all those practices. Uh, Musharraf, you've uh, I've always been amazed at your productivity because I think you have at least six or seven books out in the last four years. But uh, I do also know that your first novel came out in Pakistan in the early early nineties. Uh, it uh, came out uh, in uh, it came out I think in nineteen ninety nine two thousand. Mm -hmm. Was published in India by HarperCollins mm -hmm. and in England, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was it. Yes. And so it's almost like you have a a second attempt, a second life, and this time around, uh, you have more access and more freedom to do what you always wanted to do. And to, to me, that seems strange because you're still the same writer and the same work. It means that there's other forces that the writer sometimes, uh, it's, it's kind of luck that some people don't enjoy, and sometimes people, uh, but, and it's not because of their work, it's because of conjunction of circumstances. Uh, you know, there, there are two aspects to, uh, to I mean, Let's not put it this way. Let's put it this way that I see two aspects of uh, my life as a writer. Uh, one is, uh, you know, you you want to write, and it is an activity that engages you. It is something that gives uh, a meaning to your life, even you know, a very private meaning. And then you know, then there is this uh, what it means to the world. If, you know, okay, uh, okay, I got published. You know, I got a nice review. You know, I. Um, I have, you know, friends who write to me or who congratulate me on, you know, whatever I'm writing. So, you know, that gives you satisfaction, it keeps you going. But, you know, that if if you do not believe in anything, for example, you know, you find this whole, this whole, you know, circus, uh, not not the uh, not the festival, but the world, <laughs> uh, completely meaningless, and you know that you are going to die, and that would be it. What? Gives, I mean, what for you provides meaning in the work you do, right? So, once I'm dead, I'm dead, and you know, um, then who cares, you know, if, if a book lasts or it does not last, or you know, if anybody reads it or does not. So, I think, you know, and I think about that more because I sometimes take on projects uh, like this this uh, 24 volume translation of the Urdu classic, the Shriva, and I did the one uh, before that. And I have to ask myself, you know, why the hell am I doing this? And uh, I think, for, uh, in, in, in a very private capacity, just for myself, I think I would describe it as uh, an act of aggression against the meaningless that you know me meaninglessness that life imposes on you. And it is that okay, you know. The entire world, you know, this whole edifice, this whole uh, you know cosmic system is meaningless. But I'm going to impose a meaning on it by the work that I do. And you know, um, for example, Urdu has many great you know uh, classical works. And very few of them have been translated into English. There are the reasons for that. But you know, why would I spend my time doing that? Because I want I want to see language as 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 you know, as a as a cosmos in itself, and I'm going to create the cosmos. I'm going to curate it, and you know, bring out its you know whatever beauties it has in whatever little capacity that I can uh, go about it, and impose it on this whole you know ugly meaninglessness of this world, and say you know here is my answer to you. So you know, there are two two aspects of this of this uh, you know uh, one's relationship with one's work. Uh, you know, that's you know, that's how I yeah. see it. But if going back to to what you have said, um, when when I left Pakistan in '94, I was already writing, and I did not know you know how to. I mean, I I may have read about a thousand novels by then, but I'd never written a single one. So it was an effort, you know, trying to find an entry point to the novel. I mean, how do you go about it? Um, so that that was a struggle, and uh, you know, slowly it. it you know, you cross that bridge and you struggle and find your way. Um, but I continue writing after that, uh, and you know, there were disappointments, of course, you know, uh, and uh, there were all these struggles. But 
I mean, it, it does not matter. I mean, I don't see that as a heroic act because that was the only thing I was capable of doing, which made me happy. So, enjoy. I, I compliment. That's a great heroic act to withstand against the meaningless in this way. Yeah. I actually really agree with that, and I just want to sort of jump in and say a little bit more about that and answer the question that you asked me about living the dream. <laughs> because I didn't actually get to that. See, personal anecdote, when I, I grew up in Nigeria, I was there until I was 17 years old. I finished high school in Nigeria. And um, there's an experience I had there, there's an experience I had in the US, both of which uh, sort of stand out vividly for me as things that, strangely enough, I think of both of those similar experiences uh, quite a lot in relation to what my idea of success is. The first happened when I was about 10. I was sent to a boarding school in Nigeria. Um, in the years of the, hard, the hardest economic uh, situation in Nigeria, I'm from a middle class family, and we, we weren't rich, but we were fine. My, my dad worked in business, my mom was a teacher. But at this particular boarding school, even though it was, econom uh, it was academically good, uh, the, the quality of food was very bad. Um, there was very little of it. So he had these three meals a day. Um, and it just really was not enough. It was, it was the first time in my life I had really been hungry. I did not have enough food to eat. And that is a, I don't know, there were, probably many of you have experienced this one way or the other, but to be hungry is a, is a terrible thing. Um, I, I, I felt very sick at the end of that year, and then I transferred to a, a, a private day school. And then I was at home and I ate you know, what I wanted, I was fine. Much later in the US, after I graduated from college, and in American colleges, you know, you, you eat a lot. And <laughs> I moved to Boston uh, to look for work. And uh, in, the, in the two months when I was still looking for a proper job, and I, I think I was just sort of like working the floor in a, in a bookshop, I had so little money that for the second time in my life, I was 21. Again, I was hungry. I was eating spaghetti out of cans. Um, and those two events are actually quite important to me now because I realize that one of my fundamental goals in life is not to be hungry. I mean, it's, it sounds like a very simple thing, but it's like to have enough so that I am not in this sort of stark state of physical deprivation. I, that's, I don't want to go there. But it actually turns out that beyond that, I'm not really too fussed. If I can pay my rent and I can have enough food to eat and do some of the things that interest me, I'm okay. Now, so this brings me all around to the question of like, you know, dreams and success and all of this. Um, I never sat down and said, oh, I want to write something that is going to get me, you know, great reviews and get me, you know, flown all over the world. It's significant to me that that happened without my wanting it. Because if it stops tomorrow, I mean, I, you know, I enjoy certain aspects of it. But it's no big deal. I know I can, like, become a pizza delivery guy. I know I can, you know, go teach English as a second language or whatever. I'm fairly certain that I'm not going to go hungry again. And, and, and that's important. And this... I feel kind of connects me to Musharraf in the sense that at this point in my life, my career, I, uh, creatively and artistically speaking, I can do exactly what I want. I'm not beholden to anyone. I don't care about you know sales. I don't. You know, that's that stuff is not important to me. Um, uh, you know, money is nice, but an artistic satisfaction is actually much. I'm not trying to be heroic about this. It's just like a fact of my life. I. I just have such a simple definition of what my happiness consists of, which is that not to be hungry and to do the work I like. Um, and so I, he's, done, he's done one volume of a 25 volume obscure Urdu poet in translation. And uh, you know that's the kind of thing I consider a worthy use of one's time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's great by that. <laughs> Well, um, it was already clear to me, even before I met 
the two of you from reading your work that this idea of private artistic satisfaction is something that's very important to the two of you. And I think that uh, I can I want to uh, think about that a little bit more because the title of a session is Dare to Dream, and you know the way in this uh, the way in which this phrase appears in self help literature or motivation literature is like dream for yourself to make it be. But as artists, you also dare to dream in the sense of the, the work is a kind of dream which exists in your brain for a long time before it's finished and only you can be the judge of when it's finished. So it's a dream that uh, you see in your waking hours. Yeah. And what is that like? Uh, and also, um, there's another side of it, you know, when I was reading a, a book, I always should read, uh, uh, Ages Open City, there's uh, very early on in the book, uh, the um, as yet unnamed narrator, Julius, is wandering around New York City. There is very beautiful scenes of him walking around uh, and uh, he hears uh, some music and uh, he suddenly thinks, uh, he, 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 uh, and I quote, as if the precision of the orchestral texture had been transferred to the world of visible things and every detail had somehow become significant when he sees all the world around him infused with that music. Is, 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 uh, is an, a finished artwork a kind of dream that then like, resonates out into the world in this way? <coughs> I mean, pre precisely yes, you know, the a finished artwork is, you know, a shared dream. It's it's a way of bringing into the material realm something that existed only inside your own mind. But one of my, um, I think every artist probably has a different approach to what they think their audience is. For for me, I have a kind of like a private theory of the the twelve readers. Um, I don't write for myself alone. I write in the hopes that there will be twelve people who really get it. And that's, you know, that's something I, I've had for a long time from when I was doing blogs or even back from the time when I had like an email list, you know. Um, my first visit to India was in 2003. And I didn't have anything published back then. Um, but I wrote an essay about that visit and I sent it to my email list of like 15 friends. And that was enough for me. I wasn't not writing it for myself. I wrote it as well as I could in the hopes that 12 people might, might understand it. So the dream is to do the work you want to do and have a small group of people who really get it. Now, you might be fortunate enough that the integrity <coughs> and self-respect that you bring to your work might end up finding an audience far beyond what you could ever have imagined. And the wildest and most delirious part of this past couple of years for me is, you know, meeting people like my, my great heroes, like Michael Andache or uh, Gia Luxia, who told me that they read my book and loved it. But that is not part of the dream to start with. The, the dream to start with is I'm writing for my closest and most trusted friends um, who might get this. And then everything else beyond that is a. Uh, it's kind of a bonus, really. Um, I'll add something to what Tithiju has said about writing for a very select, small group of people who basically whose judgment you trust and who uh, would read something uh, not with, uh, with, with the intention of praising it immediately, okay, you know, excellent work, you know, and all that. They would read it as a serious, you know, as something, you know, which has been trusted to them. and you know, which requires their serious attention. And then, you know, if it's something that does not fit, uh, you know, their uh, their vision of, you know, what art is, or what literature is, or what fiction is, they tell you, you know, frankly about uh, this, uh, this kind of But even then, you know, uh, I'll give you an example of my, one of my latest novels published this year, Between Tenders. I had the first draft of this book ready in, in the year 2000. And uh, I have it, thank you. Uh, I had the first draft of this uh, book ready in the year 2000. And uh, when, I, when I showed it to a very close friend of mine, uh, whose judgment I absolutely respect, uh, he looked at it, he said, uh, you know, this is great, this is, you know, all there. Just go ahead and, you know, submit it for publication. But I held back. And I held back because, in my mind, that book was nowhere where it should have been uh, before, you know, uh, it, it could be uh, submitted for publication. So for, for, the ten, for 10 years after that, 
I continued thinking about the story. The story did not change, um, except for you know the complexities uh, in, the, in the relationship, the more layered uh, nature of uh, of the inner lives that that crept in uh, with you know this constant reflection. Uh, but it, you see, I was not sure about the voice in which this book has had to be told. Uh, I, and I experimented with endless you know, uh, variations. Uh, sometimes death is the narrator, sometimes one of the main central characters is the narrator, uh, sometimes the omniscient narrator, which ultimately you know, it became. Uh, but I was not sure you know, how far I can go in taking liberties with this, with this narrative. And if I should tell it in, in, in according to my idea of what this novel, of how this novel should be told, or by the regular conventions of the novel, in which you know, you show and you don't tell. And I, I said, you know, I'll just have to kick that aside, this show don't tell thing, and look at the subject and what it requires of me as 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 a narrator, as a writer, to 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 contribute to it. Disregard all the you know the theories of literature and novel because those theories do not uh, they do not they're not in, I mean they're not you know, universally applicable they, they can only you know, I always say that each each uh, narrative each story each story idea creates its own genre it it requires a certain idiom it requires a certain register requires a certain um, uh, vocabulary in which you know and, and you put one word which does not belong to the universe of that novel's vocabulary, and it throws it off. So those 10 years, I just continued thinking about it. And finally, I decided, you know, I've tried all the ways. None of them work. There's only one way, which is, you know, how I thought it should have been told from day one. But on day one, when I imagined it, I did not have the confidence to do it. Because I was thinking, you know, if I do it this way, everybody will make fun of me. That you know, this guy has just you know told everything, shown nothing. And ultimately, that telling that novel was was the grounds of its success and its uh, successful <coughs> critical reception that, that I got. So it's uh, going back to you know your initial question about you know the work and you know, its conception. That each each um, even if you're writing the same genre, even if you're writing detective fiction. Each um, entity, each story brings its own requirements and its own uh, atmosphere. Yeah, and actually, in addition to that, I um, just want to make a very quick defense of the novel as a space, as a kind of unique, unique, unique space. Um, usually, these things, I'm, I'm often to be found saying bad things about novels. <laughs> Defending photography. I don't know why. There's so many bad novels out there. Yeah, that's right. I don't know why that is. But look, the novel is one of the last few highly complex, highly complex, highly complicated um, modes of being that are still available to the individual intelligence that are still encrusted to the individual intelligence. Very often these days, if you're going to do an album, it's going to have to be a really collaborative thing um, with the instruments and the producers and the engineers. The lyricists might be different from the, you know, it can, it can, it can still be spurred on by one person's creativity, but you're working with many other people. Architecture, that's obvious. Filmmaking, forget about it, you know? Um, but even with, even with art and the role of the curators and the thematic limitation that is put on a particular work of art, but with a novel, you could inhabit a different universe on every single page. Your narrative's thoughts could go all over the place. So this remains one of those weird places where almost anything could happen and it's entrusted to one guiding intelligence. And that is an like an exhilarating thing, which which throws us into a peculiar challenge. We have total freedom, 
on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have the, the, the challenge of comprehensibility. And so for me, what is interesting about, the, about trying to work seriously in the novel form is never letting go of your freedom as a creative person because it's your world. Nobody's going to, you know, if you, if you, make the, if you have the right editor, the right publishing house, nobody's going to make you put anything into the book that you don't want to. I don't think Christina Aguilera produces exactly the music she wants to. She's creating a product that is going out there to be sold. And any TV show you see, no matter how lovely it is, has to be made in order to earn money. And so there are conventions, and it, with a practice eye, you can see the conventions that are being hewed to so that this money can be made. If you're writing a novel, that's that's a last thing from your mind. You're trying to create this kind of world. So you have your freedom. On the <laughs> other hand, that freedom has to function within a language that can at least be shared with a few other with a few people. And and so with your freedom, you also have the responsibility to create something that has some kind of elegance, some kind of coherence to it. It can be challenging. You know, you're playing tennis without a net, but you're still playing tennis according to the rules. Um, and the tension between those two things, for me, makes it one of the most fascinating things to, to write. I don't know what my next novel is going to be, and it's amazing for me to think that it could literally be about anything in the world right now. A complicated 300 page. Uh, exposition of any subject I wish, and if it's up to a certain standard, I, it will find readers. That's that's a that's a wonderful thing to have. Mm. But Vivek Manish has just texted me saying he's been on Twitter and Christina Aguilar has, been, uh, has just said why is Tejuk will dissing me in Goa. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christina is my homegirl. What's <laughs> up? Right. Well, it's clear from uh, listening to the two of you that sometimes new writers get asked, is criticism helpful to you? But uh, it's clear from listening to the two of you that uh, self-criticism is very helpful to you and you engage very thoughtfully with uh, all of these questions. Musharraf, I think one of the reasons why uh, your work is so refreshing is uh, also because of the uh, of your work as an enabler of other kinds of literature. For instance, when I was 28, I read uh, your translation of Tilis Me Washuba the first volume, and to me it was very beautiful, ornate and layered English that you couldn't really find in an Indian English novel or a Pakistani English novel. So, um, in a way, um, uh, what I want to ask you is, uh, there's a phrase that's in my mind, it's from the title of one of the books uh, that's at this festival, it's called The Tree of Towns, and is the novelist a kind of one man Cree of Towns who sort of gives voice not just to his private vision, which as Teju says he's free to do and this is one of the last remaining spaces of freedom in a commercial space, uh, artistic space. Is he not just a Cree of Towns by himself but also in the sense of giving voice to many silent voices in the world which can ignore the many other uh, forms of representation? Uh, I'll, uh, I, uh, you see, I translate. Uh, I translate uh, from classical Urdu, I translate from contemporary Urdu poetry, and I also translate from contemporary Urdu prose. Uh, and I write. Uh, I write for children, I write for grown-ups, and uh, I, uh, recently I was involved with, uh, with, uh, with a project in Pakistan, with Pakistan's first animated uh, movie. So I was, they asked me to uh, they, they got stuck somewhere, and they asked me to come and fix their script. Now, that was a very interesting uh, experience because everything was there beforehand. The characters were there, the, they had invested a lot in the, in the creation of the city, which where all the action takes place. So I could not change anything. I just had to make the story work within the limitations of five minute episodes. So as, um, an animated movie of five minutes, which is a series, so you know it's not ending in five minutes. It comes to a high point uh, after five minutes, and you know then uh, you restart and you have to show seven or eight character and their interaction within 
within that, you know, that limitation. So I, uh, I took on that project, and uh, I just recently finished it before coming here. Uh, it's just in 10 episodes, it will probably be uh, ne next year. But what, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that from um, working in these different genres and different uh, areas of uh, these different narrative uh, areas, sometimes people ask me, you know, how can you write in, you know, in these, uh, these different, you know, and, and I always ask them, you know, you don't, you, that you never ask a reader why he reads, you know, children's literature. I mean, there's, there's no reader in the world who reads, you know, one particular kind of stuff and, you know, that, and that's it. Because, you know, we as readers, we read in a, you know, in a wide range of subjects, areas, nonfiction, and, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff. So, um, I don't see that as, as uh, I think it's, it's a natural, uh, it's a natural uh, activity for a writer to explore. And maybe at least I see it this way. I think it's just in some oblique down to the question. Yeah. Hey, you. Um, <coughs> one of the things uh, I've been thinking about a lot lately is, the kind of role that uh, to, to, ex to, to go further into this question of trying to do something that is not firmly in the commercial realm. Um, we're not naive about this. Our books have to be published and bound and distributed, and uh, it has to come within a critical framework. I, want, I, I feel very privileged that uh, myself, uh, a Nigerian American writer working in New York, can have lots of readers in India. That would not happen without the multinational networks of publishing. That's a wonderful thing. But there is still sort of like that remove of doing something that, if it's not overstating it, it's a little bit like a sacred duty. And I think a very important part of what's happening to us these days um, is that. The people in this room, for example, who have a kind of absolute, unquestioned, religious view of the world with every I dotted and every T crossed, maybe similar to something someone might have had in the 18th century in this, in this part of the world or any other part of the world. I think such people might be in the minority in this audience. Nevertheless, the predicament of being human has not simplified itself. If anything, it's gotten more complicated. So the question of where do we get the help that we need becomes a very, very important one. Um, I know that a lot of my work in the arts and a lot of my interest in the arts comes out of, I don't think it's too strong to say, comes out of a kind of fear of being bereft, you know? If there's no God who's taking care of everything as we were promised, and on, on the evidence that we have, it seems as if there isn't. <laughs> because, you know, things are really spiraling. Then, then what? Where do we find those little moments of, of that dry piece of wood to clutch onto? Um, and that is the role that the arts, when they're done seriously, that's the role that they play. There's a lot of commercial art which can entertain us for a few minutes and make us laugh for an hour or two. But then there's the kind of work that you know you want to keep going back to that can actually do some, not all, of what religion used to do for people. Um, and that is a very, very sort of deep satisfaction. So I really appreciate the fact that Musharraf, he started it. He cast it in existential terms. You know, do the work that you find most important because before long, we're all going to be sort of dead and gone. But I think just sort of taking seriously this idea of your role as an artist as providing comfort to others but not an easy comfort. I'm, I'm not trying to be Paolo Coelho here, you know? Um, but even if you write out of a kind of pessimism, if you write it accurately and uh, compassionately, 
people might recognize their shared human predicament in it and take more out of it than you even intended, than, than you even thought was possible, which has been my experience with this book. Well, so far we have spoken of dreaming as an artist as uh, other than commercial constraints as a space of freedom, but it, since you mentioned Paul Coelho, it also strikes me that daring to dream in, uh, through an artistic vision also means critiquing other kinds of dreams that exist out there. I mean, it, it can't be a space where everything is equally valid. And uh, what you say is in, uh, uh, brings down or criticizes somebody else's dream or somebody else's private vision. You know, for me, one of the most annoying lines in literature is the line in The Alchemist where we are told that uh, if you dare to dream deeply enough, the universe will conspire to give you uh, whatever you want. So, uh, what do you think about that sort of, uh, that part of your work? Well, I, you know, I don't want to go on record as criticizing Mr. Coelho. <laughs> 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 But you know, I actually want to correct a, a particular wording you use. You know, mm -hmm. we, we can't say that all dreams are equally valid. Actually, we can. Mm -hmm. They all are equally valid. They not. They simply are not all of equal comfort to me in my time of crisis. Mm -hmm. And so, I want a spirited defense of the things that give me a kind of comfort. Um, I would not wish for all the people who buy Mr. Coelho's books by the millions to be left bereft of the comfort that they get from it. Mm -hmm. And I actually mean that very honestly. But I also don't want to live in a world that does not have the films of Satyajit Ray or Michael Haneke. I don't want to live in a world in which Kutsia's disgrace does not exist. You know, because I go to those things, that is my language. If you think of it, if you extend this religious analogy, that's my sect. And that is where I find that little that I need to keep me going. Um, so they're all equally valid, but they're just not of all of equal interest <laughs> to this particular searcher, this particular dreamer. Right. right. Musharraf, and then we open the floor to questions. Um, I'll, I'll bring it a notch down from this spiritual realm where Tiju uh, has taken it, and you know, let's let's talk about what happens in, in you know in, in our daily lives when we when we are faced with uh, a certain kind of narrative that you know uh, that is admissible in uh, internationally for uh, for you know maybe the South Asian region or for maybe a Pakistani writer and. What are the implications of that? Uh, I personally feel that a lot of uh, fiction coming out of Pakistan, I mean, we, there are not too many writers, right? Five or six writers. But I, I seriously feel that this, uh, there's a tendency, which is very prominent, of uh, orientalizing yourself, which, which exists and uh, which is a kind of uh, disservice to your own culture. Because sometimes, you know, I, I pick up, uh, you know, if, if you're living, um, if you've lived with, with, with a big family, and you have, in, uh, you have uh, seen in great intimate detail all your family members and how they work, and then somebody comes along and tries to describe them to you, as if you have, you know, they've never existed for you. You look at the person and you say, what the hell are you talking about? You know, this is not my family, right? And he says, no, 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 this is your family. And you say, you, you fake, you know, you guy, you don't know what you're talking about. So this is how I, uh, I feel sometimes when I pick up novels from this part of the world. And, and the world, or you know, the, even the language, or how a person acts is, is not, does not, you know, is not palatable to me as a reader or as an observer of my own society. So that 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 uh, that you know strikes a discordant note, uh, if if uh, I can use the term, in in the reality that exists for me, and in the reality which is projected, and that that reality which is projected and you know which is admired and you know um, celebrated is is very problematic because you know 
it tells younger younger writers, those who are start, starting now, that there is only one way of finding international success, and that is by you know going a certain route. And I always tell them, no, just write what you feel very passionately and strongly about. And ultimately, because you know, if you're writing, you're writing for the long run. You're not writing in competition with your contemporaries. Always look at the great masters and write in competition with them, because then you will always know your place, where you belong. If you write in, co in competition with your contemporaries, we are all struggling. We will all we are all making the same mistakes. We are nowhere, <laughs> you know, where the where the great master Victor Hugo, Alexander Dumas, Dickens were. So. If you write in competition with them, you will always have a sense of yourself as a writer of art and literature, and and you you would try to be honest with yourself and you know with your own uh, society and how it should reflect it. Well, it's been wonderful to have forty minutes to ask you questions. I uh, and I now falls upon me to uh, tell you all that you have maybe a minute or less to ask your. I wanted, I wanted to ask you, Teju, um, when you talk about being an artist, so it's interesting to hear you refer to yourself as an artist and not a writer. And I wonder if that comes from your affinity for photography, which I'm excited to see here when that gets figured out as well. Is it as simple as writing as a visual person, or how does that influence your work? And also, what happens when you become some sort of literary rock star and your theory of 12 becomes a theory of 34 because you have more friends now? And how... Does that change with the solitary of being a writer versus being a writer on the road and seeing more things and being around more people and being stimulated so much? How does that change? And why is there like an emphasis placed on writing for yourself versus writing for money if writing for money means you are writing for yourself uh, and uh, which perhaps means you have nothing to lose and, and that in its own becomes a different type of writing. And Musharraf, I wanted to ask you, how, how do you not, how, how do you not self-orientalize as opposed to the other writers? And if you understand the danger of that, how does that come into your work? And what are your, what, how do you do that? Because I got to learn. Himanshu is, Himanshu uh, is one of my, uh, friends and my colleague Sue's uh, work I re really admire very much and I'm, I'm grateful to get this question from him. Um, the question about thinking of myself as an artist rather than uh, thinking of myself simply as a, as a writer is actually, it's not a question of self-arrogating, it's simply recognizing what it is I do, going back to this idea that what I'm trying to do is live as intensely as possible and any material product that comes out of that is simply the fossil of life experience, of my, of my, experience, of my experience of the world. Um, I have been um, uh, very much influenced by the language that's around me, including that used by people like Himanshu, who also refers to himself as an artist, because it's, it's part of a, a recognition that uh, what you're doing is a, is, a, is a craft and it's a calling, um, that is not one thing that is off to one side. You know, you're not a typist. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's holistic, it's an integrated part of yourself that, you know, that is made up of many different uh, sections. So that's why I think of myself um, as an artist. Uh, as for the question of, um, uh, you know, what happens when you're writing for the 12 and then you get a, a much bigger audience, I think that, that this is a productive tension, and it, it actually gives me, uh, Vivek, uh, an idea for a, a panel that we might have in future, future iterations of the festival, which is to have a pa panel called The Necessity of Being Difficult. You gonna write that down? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Necessity of Being Difficult. Um, because part of what we serve in in making works of art, in making works of art that might be a comfort to others, is to give them the necessary difficulty through which they might recognize themselves. If you make it too easy, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. Um, and so that concept of the 12 almost kind of remains, you could do something that would have a very 
wide appeal. Like Himanshu and his rap group, for example, this past year were on network TV, national TV and prime time in the US and were seen by millions of people. But at the same time, the work that he's doing, the work that they're doing, is not simple and it's not easily accessible. So I, the perception I get in interacting with your work is that you actually keep pushing the envelope of not making it too easy for people to digest. You might think, oh, he's a big American rap star. It might be something to play in the background while I'm driving. Well, good luck with that. Because this is music that's going to take you out of your comfort zone. Um, and so that, for me, that's what, what keeps it at the level of the 12, of not playing to the gallery, of saying, I'm going to make it as difficult as I want to. And if you can keep up with it, you know what? All due respect. I feel the same way about my favorite jazz artist, Vijay Iyer, um, who is making some of the most challenging music being composed by anybody in the US right now, and who's had a huge success with it, even though the music leaves a lot of people puzzled. But I know that when I go to that music, and I've had enough of the simplicities and simplifications of the world, and then you encounter something that's genuinely difficult, that genuinely respects itself, honestly, it sounds like the voice of God. Um, and then the final question about money, it's good, man, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, stack that paper, make that cheddar, um, or do it on your own terms, because then it's like, it's fantastic, you know. I, I do get paid uh, for my work, but the best compliment somebody, anyone ever paid me was somebody came up to me at a party. I'm not even sure if he meant it as a compliment, which is the best part. He said, I read your book. It was like you wrote exactly what you wanted to, man. You know? <laughs> he just he couldn't get his head around it. Because for him, a book was, you write something to a genre, you write to order. And suddenly, here's this person who's written exactly what he wants to write. Um, and to be able to do that and not go hungry um, is, a, is a very deep satisfaction in, indeed. So. That's how I try to balance that out. Um, I'll take the question about how not to self-orientalize uh, yourself when, you know, when you're trying to write out of Pakistan. Jerry Pinto and I were having this, this discussion you know, the day before yesterday. So he said, so what are you writing? Did your book get published in the US? I said, no. He said, what do you have to do? You know, yes, you, you're from Pakistan. You have to write about terrorists. I'm a Christian from India. What should I do? I don't know how to get published. Maybe I should go and shoot the Pope. So, <laughs> to you know, get some attention. So, we do, we do, you know, struggle with uh, because, because you know, I, I'm a professional writer. I don't have any other job. If I don't write, if I don't, uh, you know, sell what I write, I go hungry. I don't get breakfast. So, breakfast is very important to me, as uh, Deji will tell you. So, uh, going back to you know how not to self orientalize I think. Uh, publishing uh, industry, as it has established itself in India in the last um, 10 years or so, has provided us writers who, who are writing in English uh, a huge uh, boon and a platform to, to write to our own agenda, to you know, or our own artistic agenda. And India has you know, a huge, you know, uh, middle class, they, they are literate in English, they are uh, engaged readers, and we can attain uh, selling here, uh, the numbers, if, if you are writing, you know, intelligent and if you, if it makes sense to, to the reader, the kind of numbers that are not now possible in the US. Because in the US, if you sell uh, 5,000 copies or 10,000 copies of a novel, that's a very decent uh, figure, and you know your publisher packs you, your agent smiles at you. But if uh, now in India selling ten thousand copies for for you know um, a novel which is reasonably reviewed and well received is no issue at all. So that you know that allows us in very practical terms to to write what we want to write. If it does not get published in the U.S., if you don't get reviewed in the New York Times, if you don't get reviewed in the Guardian or the TLS. That's perfectly fine for me because it allows me, you know, this license to write and continue writing. How, whatever you know, little crazy, uh, you know, notion I have of literature and exercising that 
to to my own uh, satisfaction. And uh, as the was uh, discussing that, you know, there is this uh, sense of absolute freedom. You know, it's one realm in which you exercise yourself. You know, so um, I'll take it one step further and say that you know, it's a dictatorial world in which you rule as an absolute dictator. And you know, <laughs> may you may you absolutely you know continue that rule because you know, that's. In, in, in very few artistic disciplines, you find this kind of freedom. Uh, you know, I wrote this script, but you know, I was working with illustrators, I was working with the producer, I was working with the director, and they were always, you know, making changes. So typically, each script was, you know, six, seven drafts, and and I learned a lot, you know, from the process. But you know, it was a collaborative effort. I, my name will probably go there, but a lot went into, you know, from other uh, from other participants in in the so writing uh, and you know not orientalizing yourself. Is possible now, uh, and if you still want to, you know, write terrorism and you know 9/11, I always say that you know Saudis should write a nice 9/11 novel because you know they were the <laughs> ones who did it. So, <laughs> you know, why why should a Pakistani write about you know a 9/11 novel? What about like not as a writer, as being someone educated with the idea of education as a Western notion, uh, being someone who writes in English? <clears throat> Not as a writer, but as a human being, how do you not self-orientalize? And in writing for a middle class, that's still a large number. How, are, how is it writing for people who may also self-orientalize? You know, you know, when I say middle class, I mean a readership of English language. You know, I, I, write, in, uh, I write in English, right? So I'm just describing uh, what you call that, you know, demographic, which reads my novels. My novel will be translated into Urdu in the next few months, so you know then it will go to a different audience. But uh, going back to your uh, your question about you know uh, an educated person you know writing for a certain class, I am just interpass. You know I finished my high school, then I went for a year at the university, uh, and I dropped out from there. So you know I'm an engineering dropout. I don't have you know what you call a basic degree or a BA degree, which is you know. My mother, and I always, you know, say that even if I one day win the Nobel Prize, my mother will always say, well, it's just a prize, not a degree, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, and for me, uh, this question of, sort of the audience and uh, this narrowly defined educated college middle class audience, which is actually a big risk because, for example, this year I, I've been showing up on these lists and these weird magazines. Like in the past two weeks, I've shown up on a list of like the most important living New York writers. You know, um, another one, the best uh, New York novels. Um, those things, I'm, I'm sure they're trying to be nice, but it's also kind of uh, they're co-opting you for their for their for their for their purposes. They need grist for their mail. They need they need page views. Um, I always try to keep the word we problematic because for me as somebody who lives in the US and uh, or who's very concerned with the rest of the world I see the use of the word we it's, it's, they, they, they use it in an uncomplicated way in the United States and my personal like obsession is to complicate the use of that word and sometimes when I say we, I mean Americans. When I say we, I mean black people. Sometimes I mean Nigerians. You know, sometimes I mean Indians. You know, um, or, or creative people. But you know, this idea that somehow what happens to our little our class or people who have the same income level as we do or who live in our same country or who live in New York. The most obscene thing that happens, I think, to kids growing up in the U.S. is that you're somehow taught that what happens to Americans is much more important than what happens to other human beings. You're not even really encouraged to think of them as human beings. Um, and so this is, this is something I try to, you know... What happened, for example, yesterday in the U.S., the shooting, it's a, it's a great tragedy for us. Us, as human beings. But I'm not sure it's an especially great tragedy for us in this narrow sense of, you know, we're American and nothing like this ever happened before in the world. Because when, you know, 
20 kids die in Nigeria, I'm also implicated in that. That's part of my us. But if 20 kids die in the mountain regions of Pakistan near the border due to an American attack, it's very hard to keep in mind this idea that those kids are really real also and they're mourned just as profoundly. So this is my daily struggle to try to break out of this kind of like class limitation and try to get to that next place of, uh, of being first and foremost a human being. I think this conversation will continue outside. Sorry, I went kind of deep, sorry. We come to an end. Thank you all for coming. It's been really, really wonderful. You can speak to Kaji and Mushar. We're looking outside. We hope you buy it.